faithful how long does his love endure is he going to ever leave us totally hanging no anybody got a blessing all right Thirty-eight thousand miles wow um, and it's still running like a new car so I'm really blessed with this car. I call it Jesus' car. Mm -hmm. My other car is finally going to come out of the shop Monday. Yay. They never could find what was wrong with it. They cannot go through the wiring system to fix it. But what he did was he did some kind of rigging where I have a switch. So I turn the switch on <coughs> to drive the car, and I turn the switch off to keep the battery um, when I'm not driving it to keep the battery until he can figure out where the shorts are. There's two shorts that he found in the car, but he can't fix it. Wow. So it's been in the, mo what, three months now, I think. It's been in the shop. So I'm blessed. I'm going to get it back tomorrow. Amen. Um, but other than that, I have no more pain, and I'm very blessed to know that I'm cured of all my illnesses. So I am, my tests came back wonderful. My bones came back wonderful. So I'm in great shape, and I'm really blessed. Woohoo! Anybody else? Yes, Barbara. Oh, nice. Thank you, Lord. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Destiny? No? Okay. He leadeth me, oh, blessed thought, oh, words with heavenly comfort from whate'er I do.
Everybody else got a blessing. You know, I spend a lot of time hiking with three two-year-olds and two three-year-olds. And you got to listen because we're going over high bridges. We're going over deep ponds. We're going in all these places and you got to listen. You also have to hold hands. <clears throat> what does holding God's hand do for us? He leads us. He protects us. He gives us security. He gives us direction. And there are times where kids want to be the leader. Okay, you can be the leader. But if you get too far ahead and you can't hear my voice, you're behind now. You're at the end of the, end of the line. And God does that with us. Oh, why don't you go ahead? Go ahead. But if you get too far ahead and you're thinking, oh, I think I'll do this, I think I'll do this. He's like, no, 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 come on back, come on back, come on back. <clears throat> it's, it's a learning process to get to the point where we're Christ followers and yet he lets us be a leader sometimes. It's all in listening for that voice. If we're out of range and we can't hear him, we can't hear him in his word. We can't hear him in what he's speaking to our heart. Get back behind me for a little while. You, you just follow right here so I know that you know what I've got to say, right? Light of the world, you step out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this. to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me King of all kings oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you happens if we get ahead of God he's right there to collect us we were hiking one morning I know I give a lot of stories about tiny kids but we we're hiking one morning and we're at this little pond and that day I had a whole slew of little boys they'd run and get rocks and throw those rocks right into the pond just one right after another it was cold enough that we had our Carhartt jackets on and our kind of our winter more wintry clothes and this one little one was so excited, and he ran up with his rock and did this and ran right past me, right into the pond. Right into the pond. And here's like all the kids are like, ugh. Guess what I did next? I was in the pond. So if we get to the point, we're in our exuberance, we throw that rock and we go right into the pond, or, or we're, yeah, God, I can do this. You got me here. We're going to do this. And it doesn't pan out. You know who's going to be right in there picking us up? Jesus. It was a wet morning. The boys are going, can we still go down the trail? I'm like, he's soaking wet. We went down the trail, 
got back to the car, and he was fine. But it was just like, okay, and the boys are going, are, are, are you okay? They're like, how about I hold on to your backpack? I said, well, don't touch nothing. Just stand back there for a minute till we get this little one out of the pod. So God's always there for us. Amen. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Amen. Holiness is what I need. Father, we just lift our lives up to you this morning. And these are our desires, Lord. We want to be holy. We want to be faithful. We want to be living a righteous life, Lord. But we got to hear your voice when we're walking down that path, Lord. And we lift up this time to you and ask that you would meet all of our needs, that you would strengthen us, give us wisdom and guidance for this day, cause this hour to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm up here to light the military candle at the moment, but I got to tell you, there's something else that's on my mind just from that song. 
I love that song, but what it always makes me think of is those are not one-time things. Those are lifetime things. And it makes me think of the verse that says that uh, we're to give our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And you know, I think that I've mentioned one of my pastor friends used to love to give that verse and then say, you know the trouble with that living sacrifice? It keeps crawling off the altar. (laughs) And yeah, in other words, we don't stick to it sometimes. Righteousness, faithfulness, I love that word, faithfulness, holiness. Yeah, those are our goals, but they're not a goal that you achieve instantaneously. It's a goal you work on day after day until we get to heaven. But it's a wonderful goal to be looking for, isn't it? All of them. All right. The candle. We light this candle every week. And reminder, just a reminder to us that we're going to be praying for our military folks. We also use it to pray for our missionaries. To just remind us that we need to do that. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but yesterday uh, just about 150 of our soldiers from Fort Drum were deployed and headed out. Um, Officially, they're not saying where they're headed. Um, Unofficially, I have reason to believe that they're traveling from here to Poland, a base in Poland, where they're going to be set to uh, be further made use of. We'll have to wait and see. Our political situation nowadays is so weird (laughs) that you never know exactly what's going to happen, even though you can easily see some things and say, well, this is what I would do if I was there. That doesn't... We don't have all the information, so obviously we're not in the right place to judge, but I know God is. And he knows exactly what's needed. And uh, I'm simply trusting him to take care of our soldiers, take care of them over there or here at home, wherever they might be around the world or even here right on the fort. But they need our help. They need our prayers. They need our support in any way that we have the opportunity. So that's why we do this candle for them and for the missionaries that are out doing God's work, fighting that battle, also wherever. Okay, let's take a moment to pray. Father, I am thankful, oh God, for both groups of people that we pray about them. The soldiers, wherever they may be right now, because they're putting their lives on the line. They've given up a certain period of their time, of their life, to serve our country, and thus to serve us. Father, wherever they are, they need you. They need your help. They need your strength. They need your comfort and peace. I just ask you to be with them and protect and keep them. Bring them back home safely, please. Our missionaries are in a similar situation. They're far from home and looking for opportunities to do your work, to preach your word, to bring people to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. But again, they've left home. They've left a large part of their families, and they need you again in all of those ways. But Lord, when I think about the families, it reminds me these soldiers, I didn't mention their families a moment ago. But of course, anybody who's been in a military family knows the tension and the anxiety when someone's been deployed. I just pray, God, for those families. I pray for them as they're taking care of all the different things that have to be done here at home. But most of all, for their peace of mind. Thank you, God, that you are the master of all these things. Please bless them and help us to be a part of their support group, whether it's by prayer or if there's some other way. Just help us to show our appreciation. In Christ's name, amen.
morning. Um, before I get to the announcements, I'd like to thank you all for your prayers and your positive thoughts for our family uh, yesterday. And thank you especially to those of our church family who came to add their support at the cemetery yesterday. You're a blessing, and we couldn't have done it without you. Um, today's announcements are, we have a Board of Elders meeting afterwards, um, so please stay and take part. Everybody is invited. Wednesday at 645, we have a prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, next Sunday at 9.30 is the Adult Sunday School, and at 10.30 the message will be the Ascension from Acts 1, 1 through 11, and, and afterwards there is a potluck supper. Um, we have a book and movie borrowing uh, center. Everybody is welcome to it. If you want to borrow any of the movies, please let Diane Russell or myself know and we will get them for you. And then when you return the books or the movies, just leave them in the box so we can sanitize them. We have a blessing table in the kitchen. Um, always lots of treasures there. Uh, so please feel free to look them over and take whatever you need, or if you have a treasure that you want to pass on, please feel free to bring it in. Our website is up and functioning, so you can check out anything on calciumcommunitychurch.org. Our PayPal is also up and running, so you can check that out whenever you have time. Thank you. You know, before I get started, I, I, I got a strange thing that happened in my neighborhood. A whole trailer disappeared. I mean, one day it was there, and the next day it's gone. <laughs> Sharon moved her trailer. We didn't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, okay. I'm reading out of Leviticus. Starting with verse 30, or, yeah, 1830. A tithe of everything from the land, whether it be grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord, and it is holy. Then I'm going to go to verse 28, which is a little out of order, but, but nothing that a person owns and devotes to the Lord may be sold or rendered, redeemed, everything is devoted to, to the most holy Lord. Then I'm going to jump to 21. I'm going all over the place here. I give to the Levites all the tithes of Israel as an inheritance in return for the work that they do serving in the tent of meeting. Now I'm going to read re, 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 uh, quote that, but, it's, but a little bit differently this time. I give to the workers in the Lord, pastors, teachers, missionaries, anyone who gives full-time work to the Lord, all the tithes of the church, or of the congregation, as their inheritance in return for the work that they do serving the church, or ten of meeting. I bring this up because, you know, when we give today, whether up here in front or online or any other way, there's another part of giving that we don't talk about too often. And that's we give to the pastor and those who work for the Lord. Some of us do it voluntarily. I, I'm a volunteer, no problem there. But, you know, when somebody devotes their entire life to the work, they deserve a wage. They deserve a, a thing. So some of that tithe that you give today goes to that purpose. I just wanted to bring that up because sometimes that's overlooked. Going, oh, oh, I've got to give, you know, the tithe, whatever it is. But no, there's more to it than that. 
It goes in multi-different directions. So, I mean, we're having a Board of Elders meet, meeting today. Some of it might be designated to, to different parts to keeping the church going. But that's what it's for. But let's, let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you for all the things that you've created, that you, that you created through you and for you, and your, all the things that are before and in you. all things that exist. The Bible says that we should bring all, all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse, that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down blessings upon blessings. Accept the gifts we place before you today. May the peace of God reign in all your lives. The love of God surround us, the spirit of God empower us, and the joy of God uphold us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us Pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. In your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Malachi. Easy one for you to find if you think about it. It's the last book of the Old Testament, just before Matthew in the New Testament. Roger had warned me ahead of time, I guess you could say. He says, today I'm going to talk about you. Well, knowing Roger, you know that means, hmm. <laughs> Yes, I do receive a salary. Um, I'm very grateful for it. Um, to, just so you don't get too worried about it, it's not a very large part of our budget, but it is a part of... I don't... Now he's got me almost out of words. Um, I don't get up here because I have a salary being given to me. And we've run into situations where we were running short on money and I told the board that if there's a problem, just either cut or re take away my salary, I'll survive. God knows what, I, he takes care of me. I do this because I, that's what God gives me to do for one thing. And the other thing is, that I love being able to talk about God's Word. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity that you've given us. Roger? The labor is worthy of its way. Thank you. This is true. The Bible does very definitely say things along that line, but I don't want you to feel like I'm doing it because it's my job. It's not a job. It is what I do. Anyway. That's enough. I'm going to have to stop talking. <laughs> Malachi. Okay, before I do, uh, let's see. Thank you, yes. My wife mentioned the fact that we are very grateful for your support for the uh, our family during the uh, burial of our daughter-in-law. Um, it was a very good, a, a beautiful day. And quite a number of people there to be a support. And um, a good time, and as as much as it can be for that type of meeting. What else do I need to talk about? Um, we do have a baptism scheduled, not for not for our church, but here in our church, the church of the City of Refuge Church in Great Bend. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago they were scheduled to have a baptism here. And due to some unfortunate circumstances, which they didn't have anything to do with, um, it, was, it had to be canceled. So they have rescheduled for 
two weeks from yesterday. Yeah. So, so um, just so that you're aware of that, there will be people here in the building. Uh, they will be coming in to do a baptism. Um, it's been arranged to have uh, the baptistry filled and checked. And um, but I may ask for a couple, um, man and wife, to join me that morning because it's always good to have someone else just to, um, and anything that might come up. But that's uh, we'll talk about that later on. Now, I would ask you about those who are missing today. If you look around, you realize there's several people that aren't here. Roger? Ruthie. Ruthie is one. I'm not sure the exact circumstances. My understanding is that she was playing some game with Javius and ended up getting hit in the eye and doesn't uh, can't see very well out of it and is worried that it may have been damaged, so she is resting until she can get in to have it checked out, which I would suggest should be done immediately, personally. But uh, let's see. Mary, I'm, I haven't talked to Marietta in the last couple of days. I talked to her, I think it was Wednesday. At that time, she was doing better um, as far as her spirits. She is eating. Um, I, most of you know that a few weeks ago, she was scheduled for the cancer stomach surgery, and um, they canceled on her. So she was really frustrated. And, um, not very happy, obviously, but she's doing better emotionally and mentally. She is rescheduled now, they, but not until, I think it's July. <laughs> it's quite a ways, okay. Uh, it's quite a ways away, which is uh, disturbing to me because I'm sure it's got to be a problem for her, too. But uh, I, at the time I talked to her, she was doing pretty well, and I thought I would be seeing her today, but I better give her a call. Um, also, Debbie Nicholas is not here. I'm not sure why, but uh, I'll be calling her too. Who else? Am I missing somebody else? Okay, I guess we're good. Let's, if you're already turned to Malachi, we'll take a moment to pray and then we'll get into the word. Father, you are the master of all things. So you know all of these things already. You know what's going on in the lives of our church family, in our families, in our lives. All of those things are already something that you're aware of, and I know that you're already working through them. But God, you tell us to bring them to you, to mention them and tell you how we feel about them. You care for us as a parent does a child, and I, I thank you, God. We do have some difficulties. You know these folks who aren't with us today, and you know why. I pray for Ruthie. I hope that it, her eye is not damaged in it, to any extent, that it's a quick recovery, but you know best. If she needs medical attention, Lord, please get her there right away. And in the meantime, please relieve her from pain and suffering and help her to know what is best for her, what you would want her to do. Lord, for these other folks that aren't with us today, whether it's illness or whatever else, uh, I know my own, my daughter and her kids aren't here because they apparently spent too much time out in the sun yesterday and they're really not feeling very well today. Um, understood, Lord, but you know what's best there. You know each one of our church family, you know each one of us. Thank you, God that we're able to group together today, that you brought us in, each person that's here. I pray that you'll watch over them and keep them. I pray that as we spend time in your word, that your Holy Spirit will touch each of our hearts with something that'll help us as we go through the week. Bring to our remembrance your love and your mercy and your care. Just bless, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Malachi, this is going to be a little different message. Um, 
You ever been in a church where the preacher was a, what they would call a hellfire and brimstone preacher? All he talked about was sin and the judgment of God upon you poor, worthless sinners. Well, this is a passage they could use quite well for that because it's God talking about judgment. And yet he doesn't start it out that way. You'll love this. The book of Malachi is a little different from most of the books of the Bible because of the way it's set up. It's like a question and answer session. I think I've mentioned this to some of you at least before. It's where God is saying to the priests and the Levites, the religious leaders of Israel, he's saying, I've got something against you. And then they come back with, what are you talking about? We aren't doing anything wrong. You know that one, right? Everybody can justify themselves. And then God tells them, <laughs> gives them an example of exactly what he's talking about. And then that whole cycle is repeated about, I don't know, five times in the book of Malachi. When God will say, I don't like what you're doing in this situation. And they'll go through that justification. Or we don't know what you're talking about. We're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> Only God's doing the whole talking because he's speaking through the uh, prophet Malachi, but he's giving their, uh, their uh, uh, reason or their justification, whatever, and then telling them that it doesn't work. But here he gets down in chapter 3, and he kind of changes his tune. He is a little more... Um, Intense. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, liars, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, or the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He gets onto them at the... He makes it pretty clear what he's talking about, doesn't he? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who does that, that section refer to? Anybody? That phrase? John the Baptist. He's saying, I'll send a messenger who will prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist quoted this over several times in his ministry, saying that I am this messenger. Of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to John the Baptist and they asked him, are you the Messiah? Do you claim to be the Messiah? And John told him, nope, <laughs> that's not me. I am the messenger coming before the Messiah to tell you, get ready. Prepare the way, for he's coming. And then he says, after that messenger, John the Baptist comes, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He's called the messenger of the covenant, because, of course, in the covenant it talks about the uh, blessings when you obey and the uh, judgment when you don't. And he, God calls Christ the messenger of the covenant. Come to deal with the fact that they weren't obeying 
God's law. So yeah, he, this is not a comforting message that he's giving them, is it? But I love one little phrase there. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You shall see the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of Israel kept they were teaching that there is a Messiah coming and they were praying for the Messiah to come. Only they were picky about which verses concerning the Messiah they were interested in. They didn't teach about the ones that talk about him coming as a suffering savior. They would preach about the ones where he comes as a conquering king and sets up his throne in Jerusalem and rules over the whole world with Jerusalem as the center of his kingdom. And they were praying and telling the people to pray for the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah that they wanted. <laughs> well, here God says, the one you're asking for is going to come, but you ain't going to like it. <laughs> Just that simple. But when he gets into verse 2, you realize he's talking about when Christ comes back the way they want him, as the king, the conquering king. He's not really describing him coming as the savior. That'll take place, and did, obviously. But he says, this, you're asking for and praying for the coming of the Messiah who will set up the perfect kingdom from the city of Jerusalem. God in the flesh, but ruling as an earthly ruler. Verse 2, he says, but who may abide the day of his coming? He says, but who do you think is going to really be enjoying it when he comes? Who do you think is really going to be able to stand in front of him when he comes as the judge? It says, basically the implication is you guys aren't. <laughs> You're not going to be there. You're not going to be worthy to stand before him. You'll be kneeling, bowing down, maybe. But you ain't going to be standing in front of him. And then he describes him in some interesting, I guess you'd call it illustrations, interesting ways of describing Christ as the judge. He says he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Okay, do you guys understand those illustrations? What is a refiner's fire? Well, when you're refining gold and silver, how do you do it? Yeah, you take it, it's, you put the gold and silver in a special lead-lined pot and you melt it in the fire. And then you use a spoon to scoop off all the dross and the impurities and take them out so that what you're left with, it's just the pure gold or silver. All of the impurities are gone. In spiritual terms, all the sins are burned away. Everything is taken away. Now, that doesn't really sound very pleasant for the silver or the gold, does it, if they were able to feel. I love a story I read a little while ago, a true story about a, a pastor who wanted to have a little better understanding of this verse. And so he went to a goldsmith and asked him to show him, how do you refine the gold? And he showed him. And uh, the pastor is watching and looking as again and again, he's scooping off the dross, the bad stuff off the top and throwing it out in the trash. And he says, how do you know when you've got all the bad stuff, how do you know when it's right? He says, when I can see my face in it. Think about that, God looking at us. Holiness is when we're like Christ. And we ain't going to see that totally on this earth, but that's what it will be when we get to heaven. I like that. Be more like Christ. Uh, years ago, 
one of my grandchildren came to me after a Sunday school lesson where she'd heard about how Christ comes into your heart when you ask him as, to be your savior. And she says, isn't he a lot bigger than me? Yeah. And shouldn't it show on the outside? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you should. It should. <laughs> Not in the way you're thinking, but oh yeah, <laughs> it better show. <laughs> it is amazing sometimes how kids think and they can come up with some beautiful thoughts, some beautiful ideas. So Jesus is the judge, the refiner. And what is a fuller's soap? What is a fuller in the first place? Anybody? That's another illustration he uses there in verse 2. He says that Christ is like fuller's soap. Well, I thought Jeannie might know that one, but I guess not. Because, go ahead. It's the soap that you use for laundry your clothes. Yeah. A fuller was the person who it was a launderer, laundry worker who cleaned your clothes no matter how dirty they got. And the soap that they used was not like we have nice, soft, easy uh, soaps and detergents now. The stuff they used was pretty strong. And it could, unless you were very careful in the quantities you used, you could destroy the clothes. <laughs> and he's saying, that's kind of what Christ's judgment is going to be like too. He knows exactly the right dosage. But it's not going to be fun for the person being cleansed. You ever notice that about our Christian life? Oftentimes when God shows us there's something wrong in our life and wants us to fix it, he doesn't say it's going to be easy. I had a friend years ago, somebody you guys know, who asked about all of those, I guess it was the first time she'd ever read through Leviticus. She says, why was everything so complicated? And why was there all this stuff they had to do? And my first response was, God is showing them that following him is not going to be easy. And God was a God of details and is a God of details. What I'm thinking of is where she was asking about all those things in Leviticus where it has all the uh, different sacrifices and all the things they had to do. And it goes down to you kill the animal in a certain location. You take the blood and you take it to the altar and you sprinkle a few drops on the altar and you do a few other things. And certain parts of the animal are put on the altar to be burned. And the rest are something else is done with them. And it was a complicated system. Those priests had to really know their business. To, in order to do it all the way God said to do it. Why? Well, I think it boils down to what I just said. God wanted them to realize two things. One is just how horrible sin is in his sight. And two, that the way to atone for sin wasn't going to be easy. Now that also applies to us living our Christian life. It's not easy because of all of the other pressures that are on us and because of our own human nature. But for those folks, when they had to keep track of how they were supposed to do all these sacrifices and such, man, that had to be a complicated situation. And it was not easy for them. I think you've heard me mention way back when I was uh, I don't know if I was even a teenager yet. I had a good friend who told me that he was saved very happy to be saved and that he was convinced that God would never ask him to do anything that's against his nature. Think about that one a minute. <laughs> I th it sounded good and I listened to him and then I thought to myself, everything God wants me to do is against my nature. My nature always takes me the other way. 
So we had quite a talk. <laughs> that would be, what would you call that? Easy believism? Um, just ask God to be your Savior, and after that, everything's easy. No. No, God doesn't promise that. Uh, no matter what some preachers may say, God doesn't promise that. He promises He'll be with us and He'll make it all worthwhile. He promises there'll be blessings all along the way. But it doesn't say it'll always be easy. In fact, most of the time it isn't. There are difficulties. We go through all the difficulties that the sinners go through as well as a few extras. Um, God knows that. That's the way he's designed it. What are we learning as we go? Well, I hope we're learning to live more like Christ, to depend on him more, realizing we can't do it on our own. Yeah, those are some of the things that come from facing these difficulties and going through them. i got to add the one more thing. Even though I know you've heard of me say it probably dozens of times. When we're facing difficulties, our first almost automatic prayer is usually, God, get me out of this. <laughs> Isn't it? That's our nature. We don't want to be involved in anything difficult. We want to have the easy path. Um, God, I've got uh, some, I got the flu or whatever, you know. Get me out of this. Shut this down and get me better today. <laughs> no. <laughs> God has a purpose in what those things do. God has a purpose in you going through those difficulties, learning from them, growing from them. <sighs> Maybe learning patience. I hate to think of that one. <laughs> You all know what the Bible says about how we learn patience, right? Tribulation worketh patience. And then patience works a number of other good things into our life. But I think that I am one of those hard studies on that particular subject. He keeps having to remind me. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver... And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. He says when we get all done, there will be a group that are doing what they're supposed to be doing, that have been cleansed, that have been purified, made right, and that they will be carrying out their authority, their position that God has given them. But he says then, when all that has happened, then the offering will be joyful to the Lord, a pleasure to the Lord, pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old. But he immediately goes back in verse 5, and I will come near to you to judgment. He says, first, you've got to go through this part. Remember, he's talking to the religious authorities now. <laughs> and he's telling them, you guys. There's a nice verse that talks about how it says, when Christ comes back, judgment will begin at the house of the Lord. And then reach out from there. He says the religious people, religious leaders and such that aren't doing their job, that's where he's going to start. Uh, yeah, I'm held to a higher standard because I teach the Word of God. So is every other preacher, every other pastor, every other uh, Sunday school teacher, whatever, anybody that handles the Word of God and tells you this is what God says. So if they're uh, adding to it or leaving stuff out, they're in trouble. <laughs> Just that simple. Me too, if I do that. I will be a swift witness. But look at who he's, the whole series of people he talks about. Uh, a swift witness against sorcerers, those who deal in either in magic or a worship of another god of some, in some way. Um, against the adulterers. Okay. That hits our society pretty good, doesn't it? Um, against false swearers. Those who lie, deceive, in, in, other, in, in any way, um, 
are not giving a truthful uh, view of who they are. You know what a hypocrite is? We talked about that in Sunday school a few minutes ago. A hypocrite is somebody who teaches this is the way you got to be, but doesn't do it themselves. Uh -huh. Somebody commented when we mentioned hypocrites, uh, the do as I say, not as I do attitude. Yeah, uh -huh. that's exactly what a hypocrite is. It's okay for me, just not for you. <laughs> no. God says, no, that's not going to fly. Against those who oppress the hireling in his wages. Oh, now we get into where you're cheating somebody just by the fact that you're the one who's in a position of authority and you, and he's talking about situations where, remember this is a, was an agricultural society where you would have helpers, workers in your vineyards or in your fields or even as shepherds, whatever, and didn't pay them what they were, should be getting. Or you cut back on their wages and didn't give them as, um, didn't pay for the, all the hours they worked or whatever, you know, anyway, where you were cheating their, their wages. He says, I'll take care of that too. And those who uh, oppress the widow and the fatherless, widows and orphans, you hear a lot about those in the Bible, don't you? He says, they're more vulnerable. He says, I know they are, and I know that people like to oppress them because they can't do much about it. He says, I'll take care of that too. And I have to admit, when I read that, I think about one the Bible doesn't directly address In, as, in so many words, but it is just as much one of the innocent and helpless that gets oppressed, and that is when we talk about abortion. And that's just as bad. And that come, the Bible talks about murder, and that's what it is. Um, so it doesn't single out abortion as separate, but it's the killing of an innocent person. That is very clear about murder. And he also even has rules written in the Bible about manslaughter and about uh, self-defense. He's very clear about what is right and what is wrong. He doesn't just say, some people love to quote, thou shalt not kill. But if they look at that word in the Hebrew, or when it's quoted again in the New Testament in the Greek, the word is always, thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not kill another person unjustly. You're allowed to defend yourself. You're allowed to, if someone is killed by accident, or uh, what we would now call manslaughter, there were punishments, yes, but it wasn't um, capital punishment. It says for murder, where the person in de deliberately, with malice of forethought, kills somebody, that is murder, and for that, they, God gives the death penalty. Just that simple. Um, our society doesn't. Um, I can't make the rules for the society. I would like it in a sense. I think that our society would be a lot better off if we followed the, even the punishments that God uh, addresses. But obviously, living in a sinful world, that's not going to happen. But I still, uh, I know what God says. <laughs> Just that simple. And it would be better if we were doing it God's way. So he gives, he says, he gives this whole list of people. And one of them, the last part, the last phrase there in verse 5 that he is against, he says, and those that turn aside the stranger from their right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, and anybody that leads people astray and takes away what really should be theirs, what that caused them in some manner or other to be oppressed. He says it doesn't matter what it is. God knows what's going on. And he knows the attitude in the person's mind. That's one of these things about the book of Malachi where God records the, the priest saying, oh, but we didn't really do that. Or we do that um, given an excuse when God says there's something they're doing that's wrong. He says, I know better. <laughs> Just that simple. 
not in so many words, but he makes it very clear that he understands what their thoughts are. And Jesus did that when he was walking the earth, didn't he? A lot of times somebody would be uh, making some complaint and it says, and Jesus knew what their thought was. And he doesn't address whatever it is they're saying. He addresses what they're thinking. And he tells them, nope, <laughs> that's not the way it is. I love those little incidents. Here, God is telling the, the priests and the Levites here, what we would now think of as the Pharisees and Sadducees probably, though this is 400 years before uh, most of the Pharisees and Sadducees were well organized. But it was, he's telling the Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, there's judgment coming and you guys are not prepared. And he says, when I come, I will judge. And there will be no time left to change your mind at that point. Of course, he's talking about when Christ comes back to set up his kingdom on earth. That's a little ways down the line. I say that with a little note of caution. I guess you could tell that when I said it, because I don't know when Christ is coming back. Neither does anybody else. The Bible tells us he, it will be a surprise. It says when, that no man knows the day or the hour. So it could be today, for all I know. Personally, I know, of course, that the Scripture says that all of the things, the individual events that are prophesied before Christ comes back have happened. Uh, but there are two prophecies that refer to things getting worse and worse until he, he comes. I don't know how much worse. That's in God's choosing. When he says, okay, that's enough. <laughs> that's, I'm, I would love to have it happen during my lifetime. I'd rather go by rapture than by physically dying, but that's in his hands. And he, I, he, only he knows. But there will be a day when these things that he's talking about here in Malachi are going to take place. And every one of us, whether then or at the end of our physical life, one of us, every one of us is going to stand before Christ. Thankfully, if you're one who has asked Christ to be your Savior, you'll stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, which is even though it's called a judgment seat in the scriptures, I love the word that is used. It's the Bema seat. And that's the one that was where the Olympic athletes came to receive their trophies. It's not a place of judgment to condemnation there. It's a place of judgment for rewards. That's what the Christian has to look forward to. However, if, obviously, if you turn to the back to the last couple of chapters of Revelation, you see what's called the great white throne judgment. And that's where all of the earth, the unsaved, are gathered before God and called to account for their life and for their actions. And a little way to describe that, that's interesting too. It's a in, very interesting passage. It tells that all of the dead are gathered before him and it says, and the books were opened. And they were judged out of the books. The record of, their, of what their life was like. And it, I'm not getting the exact words right now, but that's basically what it says. That uh, they were, the books were opened and they were judged out of the books according to how they had lived. And then it says, very simply, and then another book was opened, which is the book of life, the record of those who have received Christ as Savior. You see, the first part of that judgment with the books of their lives, record of their lives, shows them that, no, they're not holy. They're not worthy of heaven in and of themselves. The second part shows that they did not choose to accept God's offer of a way of salvation. And so then it says, those who were not found in the book of life were cast into what we call hell, the lake of fire. That's uh, pretty, uh, pretty clear that God is saying, 
you don't want to be there. <laughs> you don't want to be in that part. So he does tell us over and over in the scriptures that when we die, we will go one place or the other. There's only two destinations. And the decision of which one you're going to is really made while you're here on earth. Because by the time you get to the judgment seat, it's too late to change your mind. Malachi, talking to these priests and Levites, these religious rulers who are telling everybody else how to live a life to please God, and he's coming down on them pretty hard. <laughs> he's saying, you better look at yourself first. Oh yeah. And what does he tell us as Christians in the New Testament all through it? And if you look at the Old Testament, the same rules are, are, are there. That we're to be, first of all, receiving Christ as Savior. That part is the first thing that makes you a Christian. Then the second is simply, as such, you're supposed to live like one. I love what Paul says um, in, boy, was it Galatians? I think it is, where he says uh, that he's listing off a bunch of people that will be, um, not be in heaven. And he lists liars and thieves and adulterers and um, fornicators and a bunch of other things. He says, that they're not going to be in heaven. People whose lives are based on those things. But then the next verse says, and so were some of you. But now you've been changed. You've received the Lord and now live like it. <laughs> Basically, in other words, okay, you have become a Christian. Now live like it. Don't go back to any of that old stuff. Interesting. Interesting. God is good at the way he puts things. I love the way he repeats things throughout the scriptures, but in a little different way each time to, because some of us pick it up better from one illustration than we do from another. It just strikes us a little better. God knows what we need. These, uh, these priests and Levites that he's talking to, they needed to look at what they were doing and do something about it. Sometimes that's what he tells us. Look at what you're doing. You need to do something about this, whatever it is that he points out. And of course, like we've always, we've talked before about this, that point. When you get to that point, God allows you to choose. You've got two options. You can choose to listen to what he says and do your best to obey with his help to change what it is you're doing, whatever it is you're doing wrong, and make it right. That's the right thing to do, obviously. The other choice is the one that, unfortunately, being human beings, we oftentimes try for, and that is simply to try to ignore that message. Um, pretend we didn't hear it. <laughs> you know the problem with that? He knows. <laughs> he knows you did. And he keeps bringing the message around. And each time it may get a little more intense until you finally do something about it. But I love the fact that God is loving us enough to give us a whole bunch of reminders. Instead of just saying, okay, I've had enough. You're done. <laughs> Which he could do. God's love is shown to us in so many ways that some of them obviously don't look to us like a gesture of love, and yet they are, over and over again. All right, I need to quit. My time's been gone already for a little while. Malachi, message to the religious leaders of Israel, but it's just as, re just as fitting for you and me. Think about what you're doing. Make sure it's right in God's eyes. And if it isn't, change it. Let's pray. Father, you are the almighty God and you are such an incredible loving God, also a holy and just and perfect God, a judge who will be our judge at the end of time, a judge who knows everything. Um, I know that on earth, as we see some of the things that go on in our courts and with our judges, uh, they're definitely not all-knowing and they're definitely not um, holy. But Lord God, you are. 
And so when the final judgment comes, everything will be the way it should be. Lord, I help, I just hope and pray that everybody here, our church family, those we love, will first of all have received Christ as Savior, will know what that salvation means, that trusting in you, not in ourselves. And then secondly, that we will be living our life to the best ability that we have to serve you the way you want us to, to obey you, to live for you, to come and ask forgiveness when we mess up, and then to keep on going. You're such an incredible God. Thank you for this group of people that you allow me to have in a, as a part of my life. I ask you to bless each one, me too, included, obviously, to grow closer to you, to be more like you, and to rejoice in you. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, folks. You are worthy of all the praise and glory and honor that we could ever imagine giving you. Way beyond, so far beyond anything we can imagine. I do give you praise, God, for loving us and for caring about us. That's the hardest part for me to really get my mind grasped around. How can you love us? But you do, and I give you so much thanks and gratitude. I ask you, my Lord God, as these folks go on their way today, there's so many things that they're going to be facing in the next week. I don't know the individual people and their difficulties that are uh, coming, but I know that you do, and you know whatever they need. And so I ask for help for them. Lord, I pray for the rest of this day for each of us. We're going to have a Board of Elders meeting in a few minutes, and then we're going to be going to our homes and doing whatever you bring our way. Just help us, God, to serve you today, to bless you, honor you, glorify you, in the things that we do. And thank you, in Christ's name, amen.